In this session of Lamentations, we're going to deal with Lamentations chapter four, social world turned upside down. Now in the fourth poem in Lamentations chapter four, it resumes the content, style, and mood of lamentation or mourning song. Uh, the same, same style that is predominant in chapters one and two. So chapter four mourns <clears throat> the demise and the death of Zion or the city of Jerusalem. And like in chapters one and two, it begins with a <clears throat> reported description of what has happened. And we can assume that the initial poetic voice that is doing this reporting is the same as that in chapters one and two, and thus we would identify the speaker as the sympathetic reporter. And in the description that is recounted in verses one through 16, there's a special emphasis on the effect of the siege and of the resultant famine and the effects on the various elements of the city's population. And there is particular emphasis on the upper classes or those who are socially well to do. Now a key component of the literary genre or literary type of the morning song or lamentation is that of contrasting the glory and the splendor prior to the destruction of the city with the complete opposite conditions subsequent to the city's fall. And thus, as a morning song, verses one through 16 are stylistically built around the contrast of before and after pictures of the people's lives and conditions. And the reversals are portrayed as being so dramatic, it is as if the world has been turned upside down that its social and physical conditions have been radically overturned. So the descriptions carry a sense of shock, both over the extremity of the reversals that have occurred, as well as disbelief that these reversals could have even happened. So the reversals are presented as being unimaginable and unthinkable, that prior to their happening, no one thought that such a thing could even happen. And in verses one through 16, the before and after pictures give us examples of various groups within the city and describe what has happened to them. Again, with special emphasis on those who are well-to-do or the leadership. And so verses one and two focus on the younger generation, the young adults, the adolescents, the precious children of Zion. And these precious younger, this precious younger generation was once like gold and precious stones, but now that gold has become tarnished and the sacred or the precious stones are strewn throughout the streets. Uh, probably a picture of the bodies of the slain young people littering the streets. And that which was previously precious has become <laughs> like common everyday pottery. How tragic, dark is the gold. The best gold has changed. The sacred stones are poured out at the head of every street. The precious children of Zion who are compared to fine gold. How tragic. They are regarded as earthen jars, the work of the hands of a potter. Verses three and four go on and focus on the mothers and their younger children. That due to the ravages of the famine, the little children are dying of malnutrition, but the mothers are no longer supplying sustenance to their children. Even jackals offer the breasts. They suckle their pups. 
but the daughter of my people is cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the nursing child cleaves to their palate and thirst. The young children ask for bread, but there is no one breaking it for them. And then in verse 10, it states that the unimaginable has occurred. The children are being used to satisfy the mother's hunger. Hands of compassionate women boiled their children. They became food to devour for them during the breaking of the daughter of my people. Verses 5 and 7 through 9 <clears throat> talk about then the former state of those living in luxury contrasted with the now of the ravages of the siege. The ones eating del delicacies are desolate in the streets. The one reared upon scarlet embrace refuge, uh, refuse piles. Her nobles were purer than snow. They were more dazzling than milk. They were ruddier in bone than corals or rubies. Like sapphire or like lapis lazuli was their polished faceting. Now, Blacker than soot or coal is their appearance. They are not recognized in the streets. Shiv shriveled is their skin upon their bones. It is dried up like a piece of wood. Better are those slain by sword than those slain by hunger, who pine away pierced from lack of produce of the field. And then in verses 14 through 16, the former prestigious social role of the religious leaders, the prophets, the priests, the elders. It has been stripped away, leaving them to wander as if they are walking dead corpse who are ritually unclean. <clears throat> they, the prophets and priests, wandered blindly in the streets. They are defiled with blood, so no one is able to touch their garments. Turn aside, unclean, they cried about them. Turn aside, turn aside, do not touch. For they fled and also wandered. It was said among the nations, they shall not continue to sojourn. The face of Yahweh scattered them. He will not continue to regard them. The face of the priests are not lifted up and the elders are not shown favor. Now in this first part in verses one through 16, the reason for this unimaginable turning of the social world upside down is as elsewhere in the book attributed to the sins of the people. Verse 16, again, maintaining the stylistic element of contrastive comparison, that the iniquity of Jerusalem is said to be greater than that of the infamous Sodom. And the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the sin of Sodom, which was overthrown like in a moment, and no hands fell upon her. And then in verses 11 through 13, there's special focus on the sin of the spiritual leadership, the prophets and the priests, the ones who should have been living according to the Torah or the law, and the ones who should have been instructing the people in the right way to live. The focus is on what they have not done. Yahweh has finished his anger. He has poured out his burning anger and he has kindled a fire in Zion and it has eaten her foundations. Verse 13, on account of the sins of her prophets and the iniquity of her priests who, pour, who poured out in her midst the blood of the righteous ones. And then highlighted in verse, verse 12 is the unthinkableness of it all. No one imagined that such destruction would happen. The kings of the earth did not believe and all the inhabitants of the world that an adversary and enemy would come in through the gates of Jerusalem. In verses one through 16, the mourning over what has happened <clears throat> is a description of the social world turned upside down, and it is observed and reported by the sympathetic reporter. 
But in verse 17, the voice shifts to that of the first person plural of us or we. As collective Jerusalem speaks about the situation. And Jerusalem here voices a communal lament. The Jerusalem as a collective unit, it begins by declaring that there is no help from the nations. In verse 17, and then in verse 20, it concludes that there is no help even from their own divinely established leadership. And thus this communal lament highlights yet another unexpected reversal that the king in whom they had placed their confidence for deliverance, even he has been captured rather than giving deliverance. Verse 17, as for us, our eyes finished looking for our useless help and our watching we had watched for a nation that did not save. And verse 20 then, the breath of our nostrils, the anointed of Yahweh, in other words, the king was captured in their pits of whom we said, under his shadow, we will live among the nations. And this frustration of there being no one to help expressed in verses 17 and 20, is why the enemy has been able to so easily capture the city and pursue the fleeing survivors. So the second thing referred to in the collective movement is how the enemies have triumphed there in verses 18 and 19. They hunted our steps, preventing walking in our plazas. Our end drew near. Our days were fulfilled for our end had come. Swifter were our pursuers than the vultures of the sky. On the mountains they chased us, in the wilderness they laid in wait for us. And then as we move to the third part in verses 21 to 22, there is another shift in the speaker takes place and daughter Edom and daughter Zion are directly addressed. Now, although the speaker may shift back to that of the sympathetic reporter in these two concluding verses, it does seem more likely that another voice is introduced, that of a prophet. Because the tone of these two verses is no longer lamentations, as in verses 1 through 16. But verses 21 and 22 sound like a prophetic declaration of what will happen to these two nations. In fact, verse 21a echoes directly the prophetic word of Jeremiah 49, 12, which is a word directed against Edom. And this prophetic word in verses 21 and 22 declares first, the judgment will come on Edom in verses 21 and 22b. And then sandwiched in the middle in verse 22a is a declaration of future hope for Zion. Rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom, who dwells in the land of Oz. Also to you, the cup cup of judgment being referred to will cross over. You will be drunk and you will make yourself naked. Perfectly completed is your punishment for iniquity, daughter Zion. He will not continue to take you into exile. He has attended to your iniquity, daughter Edom. He has uncovered your sin. With respect to the judgment against Edom, Edom is in the area of the, to the southeast of the Dead Sea, and the Edomites were distant relatives to the Israelites as they were descendants of Esau. But in the particular context of the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem, in Ezekiel's chapters 25, 35, and 36, and also in the book of Obadiah, Edom is spoken of as having allied with the Babylonians and that the Edomites had joyfully and vigorously participated in the sacking of the city of Jerusalem and thus warranted being punished for what they had done to God's people. <clears throat> 
But again, a primary focus of the message of these two concluding verses is, is for Jerusalem there in verse 22a. And it gives a glimmer of hope for the lamenting daughter Zion. Now back in chapter 3 in verses 31 and 32, the man of affliction had given a theological assurance based on the character of God. He said, for the Lord will not cast off forever. If he causes grief, then will come compassion like the abundance of his loving kindnesses. And now that which was suggested there in verses 31 and 32, what was suggested there that would happen, is now in chapter 4, verse 22a, affirmed as a prophetic declaration that such will happen. Unlike chapter 3, verses 31 and 32, which is an abstract theological description of how God generically acts, 422a is directly addressed to Jerusalem, speaks to their particular situation, affirming, perfectly completed is your punishment for iniquity, daughter Zion. He will not continue to take you into exile. Now, reflecting on the chapter as a whole, a key aspect of traumatic stress is that it often results in a feeling that our social world has turned upside down. We feel like things have gotten all turned around and twisted so that what was normal before the traumatic events has been completely and radically altered and reversed and even done away with and that the new normal of the post-traumatic situation will never return to that which was normal before the trauma. Now, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, for many, they have felt that their world has been turned upside down. That their situation now is something that just a couple of months ago, they did not even think or imagine would happen. And even though the coronavirus situation is not as dramatic or extensive as that of the destruction of Jerusalem mentioned in Lamentations, nevertheless, in the current pandemic, people have experienced things like economic reversals, loss of income due to layoffs, loss of income due to closure of their businesses, whether temporarily or permanently. People have experienced economic reversals because of decreases in investments or retirement funds due to the fall in the stock market. People have experienced unforeseen trauma in family relationships. In Lamentations, it was unthinkable that the compassionate mothers would turn on their own children. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, statistics reveal an upturn in, in incidents of child abuse and incidents of the abuse of a spouse, as well as dramatic increase of alcohol and drug-related problems. And the stresses of the pandemic have resulted in physical or emotional abuse of children who should instead be compassionately cared for by their parents. Or at least minimally, the pandemic has heightened the psychological stress of children, of their not being able to be in school, of not being able to play or to socialize with their friends. And even for children, there is an increased stress leading up to the, all the uncertainties of returning back to school again. And also, just as in Lamentations was mourned Jerusalem's loss of their, their precious descendants, loss of their precious young people, so too there is mourning over the hundreds of thousands of death worldwide caused 
by COVID-19. And in the midst of pandemic, I think often people have felt that their world has been turned upside down. Just like some of these on the, on the PowerPoint slide there, uh, these are some headlines kind of from newspapers or blogs and that, which use that phrase that the world has been turned upside down and somebody has even written a book, the COVID-19 pandemic, the world turned upside down. A common feeling during traumatic events or incidences. When I was preparing this session, the world was shocked by the massive explosion that occurred in Beirut, Lebanon. And the interviews, in the interviews with the people of Beirut following the explosion, a reoccurring theme that was often mentioned was how unimaginable, how unthinkable, how unforeseen this event was. And questions were raised about how Beirut would ever be able to rebuild. And what happened in Beirut was a traumatic event of staggering proportions. Um, the immediate effects of the explosion were that about 140 people were dead. There were about 5,000 injured. It's estimated that there are about 300,000 who were left, at least for a period of time, left homeless. And the estimated rebuilding costs are a staggering 10 to 15 billion. US dollars. And that explosion happening, well, the Lebanese nation, like the rest of the world, is having to deal with the coronavirus problem. But that tragic, traumatic stress is compounded for them by the more devastating economic difficulties that Lebanon was already facing before the explosion a 33% unemployment rate, an 80% devaluation of the Lebanese currency since last fall, rolling electricity blackouts on a daily basis, 45% of the Lebanese population living below the poverty line. And it's estimated that the Lebanese economy will decl decline or shrink by 12% this year. Now, Lebanon is a nation that relies very heavily on imports for even their basic food supplies, but about 85% of their food is imported. And now sections of the major port through which 60% of the imports come have been made inoperable. The explosion destroyed also the port's main grain elevator where 85% of the nation's grain was stored. As the spokesperson of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency commented related to Lebanon, he said, it's an economic crisis, a financial crisis, a political crisis, a health crisis, and now this horrible explosion. And as a result of that, the political unrest that was there even prior to the explosion, the political unrest due to the corruption within the government. It's now resulted in further political upheaval as the whole government cabinet has resigned following the explosion. And there are political protests in the streets of Beirut almost on a daily basis. For those in Lebanon, I'm sure that that traumatic event within Beirut makes it feel like the world has been turned upside down. In thinking about how the message of Lamentations chapter four affects our lives as the people of God, when our worlds get turned upside down, what should we do? Well, first, and we've emphasized this before, the book of Lamentation, Lamentations illustrates that we can mourn the tragic reversals of what life was like before contrasted to what life is like now. In fact, again, Lamentations chapter four is a lamentation 
It is a song that mourns the tragic, unthinkable reverses that have happened to the people in the city of Jerusalem. It is okay to give expression to those feelings of mourning and grief and disbelief. But also, as emphasized previously in chapter three and reoccurring here at the end of chapter four, we as God's people should wait with anticipation for God to speak and to act. Chapter four does end <clears throat> with a word of hope that we as followers of Christ can wait with anticipation, we can wait with expectation for God's word to be spoken into the situation. And so we wait for the declaration to come as it came in verses 41 and 42, that the enemy of God's people will receive just punishment and that the punishment on God's people will come to an end. Perfectly completed is your punishment for iniquity, daughter Zion. He will not continue to take you into exile. In other words, God will not continue to punish. Now in chapter four, a reoccurring motif is that of ending or finishing or completing. And so we need to read verse 22a as a counterbalance or response to the people's perspective. In verses 17 and 18, the speak people spoke of what they perceived as being finished or completed. And what they focused on was, one was, that finished was their looking for useless help. Verse 17, as for us, our eyes finished looking for our useless help for a nation that did not save. In other words, they were done looking for help from sources that could not provide it. But what they also perceived as ending was their own lives and the end of the city there in verse 18. Our end drew near. Our days were fulfilled for our end had come. That all the people that the people saw in the future was their complete end. For them, the whole event was about to finish with the words, the end written across their lives as the collective people of Jerusalem. But what God declares has ended is completely different. God does not declare a complete end to the people, but rather an end to the punishment. In verse 11, Yahweh has finished his anger, which culminates then in 22a, God has perfectly completed. Perfectly completed is your punishment for iniquity, daughter Zion. He, Yahweh, will not continue to take you into exile. He, Yahweh, has finished in executing the judgment and punishment upon the people for the sins which they have committed. So chapter four of Lamentations instructs us that in the midst of traumatic events, that we as God's people do await the divine declaration that the tragedy is coming to an end. We mourn. And in the midst of the morning, we also wait with anticipation for God to speak and to act. We wait for what was anticipated as expressed there in chapter 3, 325. Yahweh is good to those who wait on him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that that person waits with hope and is silent for the deliverance of Yahweh. And in chapter 3, 31 and 32, for the Lord will not cast out forever. For if he causes grief, then will come compassion like the abundance of his loving kindness. And we wait for the fulfillment of that 
And again, at the end of chapter four, we hear the divine declaration, perfectly completed is your punishment for your iniquity, daughter Zion. So some questions for thought as we reflect on Lamentations chapter four. Question one, the picture in chapter four, verse 10 of maternal cannibalism is a horrific one to fathom. And it forces us as readers to consider the extreme straits to which the conditions of famine and siege had resulted, such that it forced the people to go to such an unimaginable length in trying to survive. How do you react to such a picture of the mothers boiling their own children for food? Second, the poem here in chapter four ends on that positive note in verse 22a. What are some biblical passages that you turn to for encouragement when you feel like your world has been turned upside down? And third, in the midst of difficult times or tragedies, we can be enticed to grasp onto messages that sometimes end up giving a false hope. So how can we distinguish whether a word is really coming from God and thus giving true hope or discerning whether a word is not really reflecting God's perspective of the situation and thus giving us a false sense of hope? 